very good evening. It's 8pm. On Brazier tonight, the career of one of the world's most gifted cricketers hangs in the balance after he refused to take the knee at cricket's T20 World Cup. I'll be talking to a former England captain about that man there. Also, what does one of our leading royal watchers make of health concerns stopping the Queen attending COP26? That news just through to us in the last two or three hours or so. And 32,000 square feet of real estate but no parking. Jeff Bezos unveils his plan for a business spark, business park, <laughs> in space. All that's coming up, but first, a news update with Polly. Colin, thank you. Here are your latest GB News headlines. As Colin mentioned, the Queen has cancelled attending a major reception for world leaders at the COP26 Climate Change Summit in Glasgow next week. Buckingham Palace telling us the 95-year-old has followed doctor's advice to rest and regretfully decided uh, not to travel to the event. That comes, of course, after the Queen carried out her first official engagement since her overnight stay in hospital last week. She appeared today on screen via a video link from Windsor Castle during a virtual audience with the ambassador from the Republic of Korea. Also in the news today, millions of public sector workers will get a pay rise next year, including teachers, nurses and police officers. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will announce the change for workers across the country in tomorrow's much-awaited budget. That comes after he paused public sector pay increases after heavy borrowing during the coronavirus pandemic. However, Labour's shadow child poverty minister, Wes Streeting, has been critical of the latest announcements. The minimum wage increase doesn't go anywhere near uh, far enough to compensating people for those losses. In fact, we calculated that when, even when you take into account the minimum wage increase, once you've factored in the universal credit cut, once you've factored in the national insurance hike, people end up being still about £800 a year worse off. And by definition, these are people on some of the lowest incomes when they go out to work. The funeral of the Conservative MP Sir David Amos will be held at Westminster Cathedral next month. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the leader of the Roman Catholics in England and Wales, will preside over the service on November the 23rd. The South End West MP was stabbed to death early this month, meeting constituents in a church in Leon C in Essex. Sussex police say they're investigating seven separate cases of women being injected or spiked on nights out. The reports have all come from Brighton and Eastbourne in the last week. Detectives have said they want to reassure members of the public and will increase their patrols in the affected areas. The number of patients in hospital with COVID has climbed to its highest level for more than seven months. A total of 8,693 patients were in hospital on October the 25th. That's according to the latest government figures. However, levels are still well below those seen at the peak of the second wave of coronavirus infections. The United Nations has today warned the world is on track for a climate catastrophe and that plans to cut emissions still fall far short of what's needed. The organization's environment programme said even with plans and pledges from countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade, the world still faces global warming of 2.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. You're right up to date. Now it's back to Brasia. Hi there. Well, the career of one of the world's most gifted cricketers hangs in the balance tonight after he refused to take the knee at cricket's T20 World Cup, which is taking place in the Gulf. South Africa's wicketkeeper, Quinton de Kock, pulled out of his team's fixture against the West Indies today, just before it began. Cricket South Africa had ordered all players to take the knee at the start of the match. De Kock is yet to explain his decision, said to have been taken in the coach on the way to the stadium in Dubai, the 28-year-old has consistently refused to take the knee and in June said, My reason? I'll keep it to myself. It's my own personal opinion. It's everyone's decision. No one's forced to do anything not in life. That's the way I see things. 
While taking the knee enjoys widespread support among players, fans and commentators, but a substantial minority argue the gesture is tainted by association with the Black Lives Matter movement and its Marxist founders. Until today, the South African cricket authorities allowed players some latitude about taking the knee, giving them three options, kneeling, raising a fist or standing to attention de Kock did the latter. But after South Africa's match against Australia, when some players stood while others kneeled, Cricket South Africa insisted that players had to kneel. South Africa's captain, Temba Bavuma, uh, said, Quinton is an adult. He's a man in his own shoes. We respect his decision. We respect his convictions. Cricket South Africa is deciding what to do next, but already some senior figures in cricket are speculating openly about de Kock's future. The Indian commentator Harsha Bogle told his 8 million Twitter followers, I fear we haven't heard the last of the de Kock issue. I won't be surprised if we don't see him in a Pratia, that's a South Africa shirt, again. Well, the West Indian all-rounder Carlos Brathwaite said... I know Quinton de Kock, we get on very well, but I want to know from him what his reason was. I'm not an advocate of forcing anyone to do something that they don't want to, but I also understand where Cricket South Africa is coming from. Well, the former England captain, Michael Vaughan, leapt to de Kock's defence. Surely, he said, it's down to the individual to decide whether he or she wants to be involved in any movement. A cricket board should request players to do it, but if that individual decides they don't want to, it should not stop them. Well, it's a story which raises, we think, important questions about compulsion and freedom of conscience. Let's turn to the former England captain, Alan Lamb, who played in three World Cups, but perhaps more relevantly was born and grew up in South Africa. Alan Lamb, thanks for your time this evening. Do appreciate it. What, what do you make of this row? Well, I mean, you know, I think it, it's up to every individual. And I, I think Quinton has the right to do what he wants. Uh, he probably will come out and say why he doesn't want to do it. But I think uh, it's made common knowledge to everyone. There's not everyone is forced to take the knee. So I think, you know, if someone doesn't want to do it, then, you know, we, we've got to accept that. But there's something from the ICC I got out. According to the Constitution of the ICC Clause 12, non discrimination and stance against racism. Neither the ICC nor, the, nor any of its members shall be, shall at any time offend, insult, humiliate, threaten, disparage, vilify, or unlawfully discriminate against persons based on their race, religion, culture, color, descent, gender, and or national or uh, ethnic origin. Now, that makes it fairly clear, and I think the South African Cricket Board should have read that because he's in the total right. He can't, otherwise, I think this could be go to the lawyers because that's the statement made by the ICC. Well, you can see why these things do potentially end up going to the lawyers because if this is the end of Quinton de Kock's career, he's only 28, he could maybe have, you know, five, six, seven good playing years ahead of him, particularly if he stopped playing in the very lucrative Indian Premier League. And I read out that quote there from a, a senior commentator from India to his eight million followers who sounded uh, pretty sceptical about whether Quinton de Kock had much of a future, even for South Africa. Then you're talking about you know, millions and millions of pounds that are at stake here. Yeah, of course. I mean, he knows what he's doing. And, uh, and I think um, if, if that's his decision... He's, he must have worked out that if he's not going to, um, you know, take the knee, um, there can't be consequences if someone doesn't want to take the knee. Um, there is, uh, there's no law saying you should take it. And I think this is the, uh, Quinton will follow that up, I'm sure, if any harsh bans come against him, um, then he's going to go straight to the ICC's, um, you know, laws. It all seems to be, as, as I described the turn of events, the sequence of events, quite a compressed decision. I mean, you say, uh, and we don't know for sure, but you say perhaps reasonably that he'd, he'd thought this through, knew what the likely, likely consequences might have been. But if it was the case that Cricket South Africa only made this ruling this morning, that if you were a South Africa player, you no longer had a choice. You had, you had to take the knee and support Black Lives Matter. Uh, then you're left thinking, you know, to what extent he really thought it through properly? Well, there's one other thing. 
Now, who's making these laws up on the South African Cricket Board? They've, in, they've been in turmoil for months and months, right? I, we don't know who's running it. Um, and, and they've been a, a shambles over the last six months or last year. And, and then they come up with a statement, um, one of their best players, they're now looking probably to ban him. Well, I, I, I just can't believe it really because, you know, we all uh, are allowed to make our own decisions. It's freedom of speech. And if someone doesn't want to take the knee, then fine. Everyone's got to respect that. He enjoys all the players, the black players he plays with. He gets on well with them. So, you know, what is it that makes him different if he doesn't take the knee? Make any difference that he's playing for South Africa? And this particular fixture today in Dubai was between South Africa and the West Indies, uh, two countries which have, you know, a tortured history when it comes to race relations. I think that's a reasonable statement. Does that make any difference? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. Listen, you can bring back to. Listen, I I left to South Africa because of the apartheid system many many years ago. But I was lucky to have parents here, and I came and qualified to play for England. And and yes, I mean we didn't like what was happening in South Africa, but I'm afraid what they've done in South Africa it's totally reversed now. You're only allowed to have I think three whites playing or four whites playing in the side. So how can you go along and tell a guy you have to take the knee, otherwise you're not playing? And I think, you know, the West Indies players that play with him respect what he's doing. You can't force the guy to do something. Do you think that's it now for Quinton de Kock? Because he played his last international match for South Africa. Uh, and actually, if, if that is true, does it follow on from that, uh, that actually he will struggle to find a professional role anywhere in the world? No, I don't think so. Have a look at the, the people who don't take the knee in, in racing, in motor racing and, and in football. So, you know, what's the problem? Why is, it, why is it different with cricket? Good question. Very good question. That's where we end it. Alan Lamb. And there we are. That answers yeah. the question. And, and, and he's a fine player, but I'm afraid the South African Cricket Board have got this totally wrong. And the problem is they've got no money and they could be sued very heavily because of what the ICC have put. Well, we've had no official statement, uh, no substantive official statement from them or from Quinton de Kock yet. I, I dare say we may get something in the next 12 or 24 hours or so. Alan Lamb, so good to talk to you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Now, our Queen made a return to official engagements today, her first since she was taken to hospital and ordered to rest by doctors a week ago. The Sovereign held an audience using a desktop computer at Windsor, which she used to virtually meet the Korean ambassador. But within hours of the palace issuing those official pictures of that engagement, a further announcement from courtiers. The monarch would not be travelling to Glasgow for the opening of the COP26 Global Summit on the environment on Monday. Well, the royal author and commentator, Angela Levin, joins me here in the studio. I'm very pleased to say, Angela, thanks for coming in. It's nice to see you. Pleasure. Um, uh, this is only two or three hours old, this announcement from Buckingham Palace. Yes. What do you make of it? Well, I think that perhaps when she thought she could do something, it, even just doing those two, I think the, the uh, uh, Swiss ambassador was also part of the evening, um, that it, it was, not very healthy for her and she's stepping back properly for the moment she's going to do something virtually she's going to make a speech virtually which she's tremendously good at and i'll have everybody watching because she always does but um, i think it's um an issue that if you are quite old that you can't bounce back she might feel much better but I think people with older bodies take much longer to recover. It's very annoying, I think. Um, young people might just jump back if they've overdone something, a good night's sleep and they're up and about. But I think at that age, she needs to take it very slowly. And I think it's very wrong when people try and push her to say, oh, glad she's back full time. You know, it's terrific. Let's, you know, give her this. She's better now. She's fine. Because I think these things move very, very slowly. And I think she needs to be very careful careful and wisely so. How did you, what did you make of those pictures? What, how did she look? I thought she looked um, a little bit anemic. Mm. I thought there was some um, rouge on her 
on her cheeks, which I've not really seen before. But she, she looked a bit tired. She looks terrific from the side view. But when we've seen the front view of her, she didn't look um, so good. And that could be just because she's tired. And also she might be unhappy because she's not doing the things she wanted. She's not even walking her dogs, which she does every day. She hasn't done that for a week. And she perhaps has lots of memories of her late husband. Because when you're not busy, you think about the person more because you haven't got something to detract from your view. Angela, there'll be people listening to us thinking, what on earth are these people talking about? I mean, they're speculating on the health of a, 90, a nonagenarian like this. What's he? Well, it's not particularly important. Oh, oh, but it is. This is our head of state. And the fact, for instance, she's not going to be at COP26 in person may be really important in the sense that it, you may then get a run on heads of state, people who are actually not particularly come. We already know that Xi Jinping the Chinese leader's not coming. That's a major blow for the organisers. The, our government organising COP26, showcasing our environmental plans. Other people might say, well, OK, no Xi Jinping, no head of state from the UK, and so you get this domino effect. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen. I'm just saying this goes way beyond as an apparent discussion just about the, the health of an elderly lady. It's yes. got consequences. She's pivotal to anything she goes to. She's got this charisma where people um, admire her so much that they will come to just say hello or shake her hand or put their head down in a she's bow. She's the most famous person She is, in and the world. she's hugely respected. The countries are not particularly interested in our monarchy, think she's extraordinary, which indeed she is. It takes the gloss off it, I think. I mean, we're lucky that we've got Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall and um, William and Catherine going as well, because they can bring a different atmosphere to it, but it's not the same. Uh, if she's not there, you, you notice very much that she isn't. And I think uh, you've got to be careful about the Commonwealth too, because some of them adore Her Majesty, but others think, well, you know, if she's in trouble, perhaps we better have a referendum about what we think about the future. I think that she is pivotal. She's very important in the world. And, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. No. You, know, you, you can see why the, the courtiers at the palace, uh, the, the royal household, the people who spin this stuff, and I, I don't mean that unkindly, I mean, there we've got the picture released. She's, she's back at work. Her engagements have resumed. Oh, and then two or three hours later, but she won't be going to COP26. You saw it with the walking stick. It was the centenary, I think, of the British Legion. To of make herself forever. comfortable. Exactly. So, they, so they, they are managing this carefully. But at the end of the day, you've got that tension between the fact that it's, you know, even the head of state, even our Queen, has a right to some medical confidentiality and anonymity, anonymity that, that we'd all expect. But by the same token, they've got to share some details, which is why people got so angry about the fact that we didn't know she'd gone to hospital or yes. something. Yes, I was told by somebody in the know this afternoon that actually she's gone back and forth to that hospital in London um, several times over years, but nobody's actually noticed. But they've <laughs> picked it up now. And I think that is because she is that much older, yeah. that the people are watching very carefully. Um, but that was quite interesting. I, I felt, oh, well, you know, maybe it's they're just being extra careful. But I don't really think so. They're probably being just right. And they don't want to disappoint everybody too quickly. So they wait and see and pace it out, as you said. Oh, oh, can we look forward to however long the remains of her such a long reign are? Is it going to be a different kind of phase that we're in now, in this twilight of this Elizabethan reign, that sense that we are a little bit on tender hooks, we are looking for signs of declining health. Tender hooks was the word I was going to use, actually. You can't be confident about anything. You can't be confident about anybody, but actually when they're that age, it's, it's more um, powerful. And it will be a different monarchy, particularly because we've had the same sort of thing for over 70 years. Um, so it will have to change. And people don't particularly like change. And they're so used to her. And all the old fashioned ways and the protocols that some people laugh at, but some people think is part of the Queen's reign. And it, it will be extremely difficult. It will, I'm sure, when, as and when that time comes. Yes. Angela, thanks so much for coming in. Lo Thank lovely you. to see you. Thank you.
Now, the Home Office says the search has concluded for a man believed to be a migrant who fell overboard in the English Channel. The authorities rescued two people from the sinking inflatable vessel off the Essex coast last night, but renewed the search for others this morning. Let's turn to GB News' Amelia Harper, who's in Harwich for us this evening. Amelia, welcome to you. What can you tell us? Well, Colin, in about the last 40 minutes, the Home Office has issued an updated statement. I had been chasing them all throughout the day for this, but they have just given us information that two Somali nationals have been rescued today, and unfortunately they were not able to find a third man in international waters during that rescue effort today. They say those two people are being processed within the immigration rules at the moment. I'll just tell you a little bit from their statement, Colin. They said on Monday afternoon, Border Force and HM Coast Guard assisted in the rescue of two men travelling in a small boat off the coast of Harwich. We're in a port seaside town here in Essex. They say an extensive joint search and rescue operation for an additional man reported to have entered the sea in international waters was carried out, led by the Coast Guard, supported by Border Force and the RNL, RNLI. So it's a huge, a huge multi-agency operation that's been happening. It was reported they had made this journey over 72 hours to try to get to the UK. As I said, those Somali nationals are now being processed and they finish and they say the UK is responsible for search and rescue within its rescue region. They say that is both the UK and international waters. So a huge area in which to cover. And they said that to try to find uh, that one man that was missing and we can only presume that he didn't make it and has drowned trying to make that crossing in a small dinghy. The Home Office has also said they want to thank people who responded to the incident. And Colin, just to give you some idea of the scale and the manpower it takes to undertake these kind of rescues, the RNLI have said that lifeboats from Harwich, Walton and Frinton were involved today and yesterday. They've all been stood down now. And the Coast Guard sent a helicopter from Lyd, that's down in Kent, and also a Coast Guard fixed wing aircraft. So it has been confirmed that this is a small boat migration incident, Colin. Amelia, thanks very much indeed. Amelia Harper there joining us from the Essex coast tonight. Well, Benjamin Lockdane is an expert in migration at the Bow Group. He is, he's here in the studio with me. Uh, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, it feels like an unfolding tragedy that's happened there in the English Channel, but, uh, but uh, on one level, a very predictable event as well. Uh, my colleague Nigel Farage has been saying recently what we're seeing at the moment... At, in a sense, the tail end of this migratory season, if we can call it that, is people who are struggling to afford the, the big ticket prices. And this is, in a sense, if I can put it in the vernacular, the sort of budget end of the market. And they're not getting yeah. the safety that they, they might have had, if I can put it in those terms. Yeah, well, you get this sort of mad rush, sort of end of season sale, as it were, towards the, uh, the end of the summer, where the weather starts to change, starts to turn. You get a rush, and obviously it's the busiest shipping lane in the world. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is a perilous journey, but it's nowhere near as perilous as something like the Mediterranean, which is, of course, far more difficult. I think the problem here is that they got blown off course out of the Channel into the North Sea, which is, of oh. course, a lot more perilous. I mean, as far as we can tell, and obviously we'll get more from the Home Office as, as they get to the bottom precisely of what's happened, and they won't, will not want to say definitively, they can't say definitively until they're absolutely sure, until before they can start sharing the details. But we're talking about people who are at sea, we think, for the best part of over 70 hours. Yeah, so this is what happens, obviously, when you get the bad weather and people get blown off course. It's, it's they're going around in circles or, you know, they're not finding land. And then, you know, as time goes by, there's more chance of an accident occurring. One of the things that makes these crossings usually a lot safer than the Mediterranean is, of course, we've got the lifeboat service and the border force picking people up actually mid-channel sort of intercepting them and taxiing them in. You know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, controversy about that, whether that's the right policy, but it certainly saves a lot of lives. Um, but fundamentally, what we need to do is eliminate all of the pull factors which make people get into the boats in the first place and make those crossings, because, you know, it's, it may be one or two people drowning over the, the course of tens of thousands over the years. It's a small number, but, you know, any loss of life is a tragedy. And um, unless we eliminate those pull factors, they're going to happen. Benjamin, you, you will always get people who will point to pictures like this, and you can think back to that, that dreadful case of the, the young toddler Alan Kurdi mm. uh, on the uh, Greek coast back in 2015. It can be very highly emotive, this, can't it? And you'll get some people who will say, well, look, this is why we need something more like 
open borders or a fairer system of allowing migrants in. Uh, the contrary argument to that, and it's one I happen to agree with, and I, I imagine you probably do as well, which is that actually this is the collateral damage, the tragic collateral damage of a policy that, that is equivocal about what it's saying to people about coming mm -hmm. to Britain illegally. Uh, and one of the points that was made by the, the Abbott government in Australia was that if you make it abundantly clear to people that they will, uh, if they, even if they get into your country illegally, they have no future there, they'll be sent back, then ultimately what that does, by being cruel to be kind, is you are heading off those future problems where lives will be lost. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, you know, sometimes what seems like the charitable and good and, and nice option is actually going to lead to more tragedies because if you take a more lax approach, it encourages more people to make these crossings and then there's a higher chance of these tragedies occurring. Um, but fundamentally, you know, we can't take in the whole world. There has to be some limit on things and no matter how generous we are, uh, there's always going to be illegal migration because there are, there is, there's always, always going to be a, an area um, outside what we can allow because we, we just simply can't allow everyone to come. So if we don't have a rigorous and tough approach on this, that we don't disincentivise the crossings, then, then we will always see these tragedies. Can I just turn to the nuts and bolts of this, which actually isn't right now what's happening in the Channel, it's happening in Parliament. You've got the, the, the Borders Bill that's going mm. through. Um, give us your sense, if you would, of the direction of travel there, how, how that bill will really, when it becomes law, as and when it becomes law, change things. I mean, for instance, things like these jet ski interceptions that we expect to be carried out, and we have uh, legal clauses now added to this bill that say if you are a member of the Border Force, and let's say you've got a, a rickety craft like this one, and you're stopping it mid-channel, and as looks like may be the case here, there's a fatality that ensues from that. Mm. You need to know as a member of the Border Force that you will not be on the hook for that, that you will not be potentially culpable for manslaughter. Yeah, so obviously the uh, Borders Bill is one thing, but I think it's um, the main thing is the Human Rights Act and ECHR jurisdiction. While we're in the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction, there's a lot of things we can't do, even if this bill passes. So I don't think the bill is necessarily worth the paper it's written on unless we withdraw from the Human Rights Act and ECHR. Um, but, you know, there are, there are all of these schemes. They come up with the jet skis and the pushing back boats and the, uh, there was one point where they discussed heat cannons to try and make it, you know, go and blow people back. All sorts of, you know, sort of slightly farcical Processing ideas. Processing in the central yeah, African Republic. Yeah, all sorts of stuff that comes up. But really it's just a distraction because the solution is very simple. You need to disincentivise it. You know, if people come over and they get, in, get put up in four-star hotels, they know they're never going to be returned. You know, in the whole of 2021, there's not been a single migrant returned who's come over and we've had almost 20,000 come. Um, unless we disincentivise that, you know, all of this stuff is just distraction. And just very, very briefly, 20,000 this year, double last year, do you expect that curve trajectory to carry on? Mm. Will we get more than 20,000 next year as things currently stand? Yeah, absolutely. If we don't deal with the, the root causes, which are the pull factors, um, then it will continue to rise at the rate it's rising because, you know, it's great advertising. When you see people landing in Britain being put up in four-star hotels and having everything provided for them, that acts as advertising uh, material for the human traffickers who can then turn around to people and say, look, it worked for them, it will work well, for you. And sadly, the corollary of that, I suppose, is when you see pictures potentially of bodies being dragged mm. from the water, as may be the case here, that uh, may have a deterrent effect. That's the, 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 the sort of converse effect, I suppose. Mm. Uh, Benjamin Lockney, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thank you. After the break, is it reasonable to still be blaming Margaret Thatcher for the problems faced by one British city 31 years after she left office.
Well, how long has to elapse before it becomes unreasonable to blame a predecessor in politics for current difficulties? The question's prompted by the account given to MPs by the SNP leader of Glasgow City Council. Councillor Susan Aitken was giving evidence to Westminster Scottish Affairs Committee about preparations for the COP26 summit, which, as you'll know by now, taking place in Glasgow. She blamed Margaret Thatcher, Lady Thatcher, for Glasgow's rat infestation, even though Lady Thatcher stood down as Prime Minister some 31 years ago. Well, joining me now is Brian Monteith, our uh, occasional, if not regular, commentator uh, on Scottish politics. Brian, thanks for joining us. We talked about this last week, actually, the bin strike. Uh, other people are striking, but the bin strike in particular in Glasgow. Uh, it seems that Councillor Aitken thinks that the, the roots of that go, go deep and back a long way. Well, the hypocrisy is rank uh, because the Roots go back far further than Susan Aitken would like to admit. The truth is that the era of Thatcher, of Margaret Thatcher, was ushered in by the SNP. And she obviously would like to forget that. But in 1979, it was the SNP who moved to make a motion of no confidence in the Labour government uh, because they wanted rid of uh, Labour. Uh, and Margaret Thatcher then moved her own motion. The SNP was duty bound to support it, and the Labour government lost by one vote. It was the SNP who delivered Margaret Thatcher's election chance and election victory. And so, when we, if we want to be historical about it, it really is uh, Susan Aitken's party that ushered in Thatcherism. And if she is upset about that, she really is in the wrong party. <laughs> the, um, she's been criticised for being delusional. I mean, it has to be said, doesn't it, Brian? You, you will get people who still, uh, still are reflexively uh, anti-Thatcher. Uh, she has the ability, even you know, so many years after she's after she, her death, to to make people uh, uh, start frothing. Um, it, and it's difficult to see here. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, uh, industrial decline, the Clyde shipbuilding, heavy industry, that sort of thing, but. But rat infestation, I mean, where does, how do you trace that back? Well, um, there is no way to trace it back. Uh, of course, it's to change the narrative, uh, which is part of the political process SNP wants to embrace and create. The truth is that from, for instance, 1980, Thatcher government was pouring money into Glasgow for East, East End regeneration. Uh, the very conference centre that COP26 is being held in was uh, receiving money from Thatcher's government in 1985 to be built. Uh, the Garden Festival in 1988, more money from Thatcher's government. The City of Culture in Glasgow in 1990, more money from Thatcher's government. The truth is that Glasgow was just unfortunate. It had so much heavy industry and it needed help, a lot of help. Uh, and Thatcher's UK government came to Glasgow's aid. It's an argument that maybe not enough, but it certainly did not walk away or neglect Glasgow. It supported Glasgow. It was interesting looking at some of the commentary on, on Twitter on this, Brian, that a lot of people making the point that it can appear sometimes that the SNP, maybe more than some other political parties, not idea to, to answer this charge, but feel they need panto villains uh, to, to distract attention <laughs> away from sometimes their own, their own failings, because they have been in charge for, for, for quite a while now. Well, they have been in charge for 14 years. And of course, one of the things that I think I've mentioned uh, to you before is that what they have done is they've centralised government. They've taken money away from local authorities. Susan Aitken, being an elected member of the SNP, is actually not allowed to criticise other elected members. In other words, she's not allowed to criticise uh, Nicola Sturgeon, who is, of course, a Glasgow uh, MSP as well as First Minister. Uh, or she might receive uh, uh, summary action, uh, disciplinary action from her party. So we have a situation where the SNP uh, punishes Glasgow by stopping it having the money it needs, but the, the, the elected SNP members cannot complain about being deprived of that funding. It's, it's actually an SNP problem that Scotland's suffering from, not a Thatcher problem. Brian Monteith, always good to talk to you. Appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Well, now, the Daily Mail uh, has a piece today looking at the growth of uh, 
woke stories, if we can call them that, aimed at young readers in branches of the book retailer Waterstones. The bookshop is currently uh, prominently stocking titles such as How to Be a Better White Person and Gender Swapped Fairy Tales. There's also a bedtime story about a gingerbread man refugee. Uh, but this is where it becomes interesting for us and for regular viewers who'll we'll see Andrew Doyle in here. Uh, awkwardly, as the Daily Mail puts it, uh, the retailer has mixed up these uh, woke tomes for children with a satire. The satire is called My First Little Book of Intersectional Activism, written by Titania McGrath, uh, which, as many of you will know, is not actually the name of a real author, but actually is a pseudonym. It's a pseudonym used by uh, our very own Andrew Doyle, who I think is not able to join us right now. We've given him such a huge preview. Heavens above. We'll be back to him after the break. Time for that break now. On Tonight Live, it's Mark Dolan in for Dan Woodson. And my big question guest is George Best's widow, Alex Best, who'll be sharing her memories of being married to a football genius. Our very own Nigel Farage on what Rishi Sunak needs to do in tomorrow's budget. And should there be a referendum on Boris Johnson's net zero target? Who voted for all of these policies? And in my monologue, I'm taking on Joanna Lumley, who thinks we should have wartime rationing to save the planet. See you at nine. Now, the BBC were on a COVID ward this morning interviewing patients. It wasn't easy listening. I'm angry, said one man who was very obviously struggling to breathe. People should be wearing masks, he said. That was the same message I got last night when I spoke to a senior SAGE member and unquestionably one of Britain's most respected epidemiologists, Professor John Edmonds. Mask wearing was, he said, a sensible measure that the government ought to have persisted with. Scientists have come in for a lot of stick over the last year and a half, so credit to Professor Edmonds. He's a fan of restrictions, even as his own modelling seems to have altered the entire balance of the argument about those restrictions, at least for the remainder of this year. What do I mean? Well... Partly, I mean this, this will come as a shock to Labour, which only three days ago backed the immediate restoration of lockdown light. The party seems to have taken a lead from Matthew Taylor, former advisor to Tony Blair, now chief executive of the NHS Confederation. 
He's only been in the job for a few months and made headlines last week when he demanded the reintroduction of mandatory masks and working from home and a few other things besides. Seven days ago, he said, We are right on the edge and it is the middle of October. It would require an incredible amount of luck for us not to find ourselves in the midst of a profound crisis over the next three months. Well, it seems we've had that slice of luck that Matthew Taylor thought incredible. Last Tuesday, the UK reported 223 COVID deaths, the highest number for seven months. Daily cases seem to be heading towards 50,000 a day and beyond. But a week is a long time in COVID politics. After 18 consecutive days of rising cases, we've had at least two days of falling cases. Today's figures actually went up, but that was a mainly a technical glitch caused by data collection in Wales. But what really makes Matthew Taylor's intervention seem ill-timed is the latest modelling for which we have, yes, Professor Edmonds of SAGE to thank. It suggests infections will fall rapidly in the next few weeks. Other unpublished models confirm this, suggesting the number of cases could be as low as 5,000 come Christmas. Matthew Taylor is not the first person to demand a lockdown, only to be made to look foolish by a change in the data. At least he can plead prudence. Those parts of the NHS he speaks for can be forgiven for wanting to blunt any winter Covid surge. But the alacrity with which Labour took up his warning does or will, I imagine, smack us a smack of opportunism for some. Playing politics with Covid is a mugs game, as Professor Robert Dingwall says in an article today. There are 12,000 deaths in the UK every week, of which about 800 to 1,000 are Covid-related. But more importantly, the number of cases is not a particularly good guide to where we are either. Something like 40,000 new cases, as I say, being reported every day. But as Professor Dingwall makes clear, this tells us nothing about the severity of infection. He writes, most of these results come from people who are either vaccinated or in groups that are at low risk of severe infection, such as teenagers. A positive test in October 2021 does not have the same meaning as a positive test in January 2021. But here's the kicker. Most COVID admissions are now for patients who are seriously but not critically sick. For that, we have the vaccine programme to thank. Let me take you back to where I started. Then the item on the BBC this morning from a hospital where patients were angrily demanding the return of mandatory masks. In another part of the hospital were the patients who couldn't speak, who couldn't complain about masks because they were all on ventilators and all fighting for their lives. The doctor explained why this was. They were, he said, unvaccinated. Simple as that. Well, that's where our focus should be, not on imposing another unnecessary lockdown or raving that people who don't wear masks are social pariahs. That's the brazier angle. Let's reprise where we were before the break. The Daily Mail has a piece today looking at the growth of woke stories aimed at young readers in branches of the book retailer Waterstones. But who could have guessed a book by our own Andrew Doyle was in there, had snuck in there. Nothing he'd done. Uh, he was mistaken. We can, let's, let's, let's show him. Let's see Andrew, shall we? Hi, Andrew. Uh, this is your, Hi, your, uh, your nom de guerre, isn't it, Titania McGrath? Uh, it was her book That's right. about, in, about intersectionality, which was leading the young children of uh, young people of Britain astray. Yeah, so the, I mean, this is an article in today's mail. Um, a, it's a sort of overview of the extent of the, the problem of uh, quote unquote woke children's books that are going into uh, mainstream uh, bookshops. And this investigative journalist has, has been going around various uh, branches of various mainstream bookshops around the country and sort of taking photographs of these shelves. And, the, and it's books like Woke Baby, Feminist Baby, Gender Swapped Fairy Tales, How to Be a Better White Person, and one branch of Waterstones has put my book in there, my, well, my book, Titania McGrath's book, which is called My First Little Book of Intersectional Activism. And they th I, th I assume they thought that this was a, uh, a sincere uh, sort of woke children's book, but of course it's, a, it's not, it's a satire of it. But, but um, it sort of just goes to show that it doesn't really look out of place. Yeah, yeah, I mean, extraordinary. I mean, you, you, know, you couldn't make it up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, people will be surprised that... That, that in this section in a bookshop, we're getting what will feel to many people like pretty clear indoctrination of young minds. Absolutely. I mean, this is the uh, a key tactic in the critical social justice movement, which is, of course, you know, effectively in order to be uh, 
you know, an adult, you have to be effectively socialized as a child. You have to instill children with, the, with critical thinking skills. But of course, critical thinking skills are anathema to the critical social justice movement, ironically, given their name. Uh, so the best way, I mean, strategically, it makes sense. The best way, because because their arguments collapse on scrutiny, if you can get people young enough, if you can indoctrinate those ideas into children young enough, then then it's going to be all the harder to de-radicalize them later on. So I think this is this is um this is the the strategy is, but I don't know to what extent it's going to work. I imagine these sorts of books like Anti Racist Baby, they're so self evidently absurd. I think it's more about. Uh, parents sort of showing off to their friends that they're on the right side of history. These sort of big books that they it. leave out, you know. Yeah, I think that might be it, really, because I can't imagine that these books actually have any kind of serious effect on on, on children. I've read Anti Racist Baby by Ibram X Kendi, <laughs> and it is a preposterous piece of work. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's got a more preposterous title than your book. That's a send up. I mean, that, that that's the amazing yeah. thing. It, but you you and exactly. I both believe in in the power of novels as a manual for the human mind don't we? I think that's a reasonable claim. And I know it's certainly a line I try on my children from time to time to wrest their eyes away from their iPhones. It always fails. But I mean, <laughs> I, I, I love the idea and I deeply care about the idea that actually it's literature that leads people to an understanding of the world around them. And this kind of crass indoctrination in a bookshop that ought to know better, it depresses the hell out of me. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the way we learn about the world particularly as young people, but not just as young people, actually, is to, to read the great works of literature, uh, to find ourselves in other people's shoes and to learn about other experiences and other perspectives. Uh, what this does is the opposite of that. It doesn't open your mind to other perspectives. It insists on a kind of rigid conformity to one singular, reductive and very simplistic uh, view of the world, which, which just sees things really in terms of binaries of, of, of good and evil and right and wrong and, and, and doesn't explore those kind of shades of grey that you get in great literature. So I think it is I think your view is absolutely right. And I think it's a shame that these books are proliferating at such a, such a, a rapid extent. And um, no, not a good thing at all. No. Uh, I wonder what Tatani McGraw would make of our, our next story, Andrew. It's a serious story, actually. So let, let me just read the introduction. It's been claimed that uh, some lesbians are feeling pressured to have sex with trans women, even trans women who still have male genitalia, lest they be accused of transphobia. Andrew, this is a, it's a very small survey, and I suppose for that reason, given its sample size, it, was, it certainly wasn't quite 100, 80 or so. Uh, it comes with 80, a big yeah. caveat and health warning, doesn't it, uh, as, a ref, as not necessarily a representative sample. But within it, anecdotally, are, are stories emerging of people, of women, feeling pressured uh, to behave in a way they, they really shouldn't be behaving because they, they don't want to offend the... They don't, they don't want to be called a turf, a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. That's right. Th this article is called Quite a stir, a stir Today on Social Media. This was for the BBC. It's by Caroline Lowbridge. And as you say, uh, it's interviews with many, many uh, women, lesbians, some trans people as well, testimonies from people who were saying that they feel they've been pressured or coerced into accepting uh, trans people as part and if they if they say that you know trans people just simply aren't in their dating pool because lesbians aren't attracted to people who identify as women they're attracted to people who are biologically women um, but even for saying that they're often a, a threatened harassed called things like a genital fetishist a pervert uh, things like this this is very reminiscent of the old sort of uh, homophobic tropes of the 1980s you know where they would say oh well I'm sure you've to gay men you've just not met the right girl yet or they'll say to, to women oh you just need the right bloke and this kind of thing it's a rehabilitated form of that what's very interesting about this is I appreciate a lot of the criticism of this article coming from very mainstream commentators online has been based on the idea that these are just anecdotes this is just anecdotal evidence they're basically saying that these women are lying uh, about this um, which I think is very ungenerous. But not only that, these are the people who always go on about the importance of lived experience and the importance of always listening to people's lived experience and taking it on trust. But of course, when they say lived experience, it has to be of the approved kind. So these women's lived experience can be dismissed uh, and they can be referred to as transphobes. Um, I think it's a real problem. The thing is, I accept that anecdotal evidence has its limits. But with this case, you can see there is a, an awful lot of evidence uh, going from the, the people who are harassing and threatening themselves. In fact, there are whole websites that collect together thousands and thousands of examples. I mean, the first time I saw a tweet saying that uh, lesbians who won't sleep with someone with a penis, genital fetishists and bigots and evil, I wrote it off as just some idiot on Twitter. Now I've seen thousands and thousands of them. It's a real thing. There's a lot of evidence for it. Those people who are claiming it's not a, it doesn't exist, they either don't know or they haven't really looked into it or they're lying. I mean, that's the other, that's the other possibility. 
But one of the really interesting things about this article on the BBC is they quote Stonewall. They asked for an interview with someone from Stonewall. Of course, Stonewall don't give interviews uh, anymore. Uh, but they did give a statement. And they said uh, that effectively, they said, nobody should be, ever be pressured into dating or pressured into dating people they aren't attracted to. But if you find that when dating, you are writing off entire groups of people, like people of color, fat people, disabled people, or trans people, it's worth considering how societal prejudices may have shaped your attractions. In other words, it is comparing same-sex attracted people, lesbians, to racists. And as Kathleen Stott pointed out, if that's not pressure, yeah. then what is? I mean, that's and absolutely appalling. That's coming yeah. from the head of Stonewall. Andrew, we've got to leave it there. Really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Andrew Doyle. Now, with another surge in knife crime and authorities warning of a fresh wave of terror attacks, a Birmingham mother whose own son was killed in a stabbing has told GB News bleed control kits are urgently needed across the country. Lynn Baird has fought a one-woman campaign to have the packs of heavy-duty bandages and tourniquets installed at key locations in towns and cities. So far, 2,000 kits have been distributed and have already been instrumental in saving the lives of two people stabbed recently in Birmingham and London. Our home and security editor, Mark White, reports from Birmingham. You'll see that in the next hour. Uh, let's talk instead about a story we were hoping to give you, but we thought we couldn't because Andy Loud, space writer, wasn't available, but he's just beamed in from the Midlands. Uh, Andy, thanks very much indeed for joining us. We booked you to talk about Jeff Bezos' new plans for orbital reef in other words a business park in low earth orbit do explain we've got some lovely pictures to illustrate your points Yes, I mean, it's an interesting idea. With the International Space Station on the coming slowly, it seems, going on the down low, and Russia planning on to pull out in a couple of years' time, China building their own space station, Russia going for their own, the private sector is now stepping in to build low Earth orbit space stations. And it's the, ne it's the next step, really, since they're flying into, into low Earth orbit. And his plan is to have what he's called a business park, which is really great, parking in low Earth orbit. And the idea is that uh, researchers, universities can go on board to do their research and matters like that. Private companies can, and sections of it could be used for hotels. So it's a multi-purpose, low-Earth or low orbit space station. An absolutely fantastic idea, really, when you think about it. And in many respects, it's probably going to be more practical than the, the Great International Space Station, which, to be honest, was somewhat underused. But here we can see the power of the building something which could be quite, I think, quite remarkable. This is the, really the beginning of the future of space flight. Do you know what, Andrew? When I, one of the things that convinced me that the promise that this would be in space and, and operating by the end of this decade, one reason I took that seriously was because of the involvement of Boeing. But actually, then I scratched that and thought better of it and thought, no, actually, the reason to have confidence that this isn't a pipe dream is because of Bezos. Hmm. Absolutely right. And you, <clears throat> people like Bezos, Musk, um, Branson uh, do things that governments can't do. They get on with it and they, they're not sitting there having about endless committee meetings deciding what we might do and, and you know, what colour do we need to paint this and does that make things correct or not? They just get on with it. And I, and I think this is why it will happen. And it's needed that. Um, it, it's interesting. There's a very big difference between the West and the East when it comes to to developing space. In the West, of course, the great democracies, if you like it, take take time to get things done. In the East, they do things by decree. So in China, we're doing it, and that's it. That's exactly how private companies operate. The CEO says we're doing it, and they go ahead and do it. And I think that's is why they've 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 stolen a march on people like NASA with this one. Yeah, and the, I, those images that go with the story, I mean, beautiful. And there's one of of the Sunrise, mm. sunset, you couldn't tell which, but you get, of which you get multiple sunset, sunrise every, every day on the space station. Every 45 minutes, there will be a sunrise or a sunset. That's correct, because you orbit every 90 minutes. Wonderful, isn't it, that, eh? Really That's a good lovely <laughs> idea. Uh, Andy, it's so good of you to join us, and uh, let's hope, fingers crossed, Thank that you. comes to pass, doesn't it? Andy Loud, thanks very much indeed. Uh, our lead story today, uh, Quinton de Kock, South African uh, cricketer, their wicketkeeper, talismanic player, very successful, one of the world's greats uh, right now in world cricket. He uh, plays for South Africa. They had a match today against the West Indies. The diktat went out before the match from Cricket South Africa that all players will be expected to, to take the knee. That's not something he's done before. He declined to play for reasons he's not given yet. The, su the suggestion is it was uh, a decision rooted in his, in his conscientious objection to Black Lives uh, Matter. To what extent is, is, is it now compulsory 
uh, for some players to take the knee. Your response is emphatically that it ought not to be. It ought to be a private matter for individuals and their consciences. Um, Elliot says, of course not. If political gestures are to be allowed in sport, which is not a great idea in the first place, they should never be compulsory. We are the UK, not the USSR. We're talking about South Africa, though, in this instance, not the UK. Uh, Neil, disgraceful that sportsmen are being coerced to pander to BLM Lex. Why are they getting there on their knees in the first place? Uh, Brad, uh, nice to see Quinton de Kock is a sportsman with a backbone, unlike the spineless sheep that passes Premier League footballers. Uh, strong words. Uh, Kevin, he should be applauded. Sport and politics are not and never will be compatible. They may not be compatible, but they're often thrown together. Thanks for your contributions to poll. You can still vote for uh, that story if you like. Up next, it's Mark Dolan. Hello, we've got some very unsettled weather across the UK over the next few days. Heavy rain at times with Met Office weather warnings in place. Windy too, and those winds are coming in from the southwest.